your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. Infinite complacency. People went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Welcome to another episode of Into the Fray, hovering over you like a black triangle in a deserted field. Visit the mothership at intothefrayradio.com. There you can find all the episodes, the blog posts, ITF gear, and sign up for the free guest newsletter. The weekly show is, of course, always free and available in all podcatchers, but if you'd like to support the show, and why wouldn't you, go to the website and click Become an Insider, which in turn gets you extra content each and every month. And by the way, if you would be so kind as to leave a rating and review in your listening platform of choice, Cosmic Karma shall be yours. Be part of the discussion by joining the interactive ITF Facebook group, Follow on Twitter at ITF underscore radio and Instagram. If you have an experience that you'd like to share, email Shannon at intothefrayradio.com or call the hotline anytime at 844-866-3366. Thanks so much for listening. Now, if you would be so kind, buckle up your safety belts. Put that tray table in the upright position. Liftoff is upon us. So on this edition of Into the Fray, I have on with me Dr. Scott Kolbaba, and he is the author of Physicians Untold Stories, and it is stories as told by him and actually 26 other physicians that you have, uh, you've come across and probably all personally worked with. So uh, welcome, Scott. Thanks, Shannon. Great to be here. Yeah, so I, I combed through the book, and I'll start off by saying that I easily could have covered every story, but we're not going to do that because we have to save some for the reader, but we are only going to cover a few here on this episode. And I highly encourage everyone to go out and get this book. It's a great read and it really makes you feel good. You know, you just, you really start to think that, okay, well, maybe once we leave this side of things, that's not it for people. So a very enjoyable read, Scott. That's great. That's great. Thank you. And before we get into that, though, I would like to start with your beginnings. You know, you wanting to become... A doctor. I mean, was this a calling for you? Is this something that was inherent in you from a young age? You know, I think we all have these curved roads that lead, you know, ultimately to our destination, but uh, we make uh, side trips uh, along the way. Ever since I was a, oh, probably in kindergarten, I wanted to be a doctor. So that was a, a goal and dream for me for a long time. And I got into uh, college. And I, I was taking all these prerequisites, and some of them were really not very fun. And one of those was embryology. And I'll never forget embryology because with embryology, they have they have sections, about 100 sections of a little uh, embryo frog or something, you know, and you have to look at each section to see what's there. And I was thinking to myself, this is really boring. And the girl across from me who was studying with me, uh, getting ready for the, the big test the next day, and the whole the whole classroom was filled with people studying the, that night, looking at the slides. And I'm thinking, oh, this is this is terrible. I hope this is not what medical school is going to be all about. And she said to me, isn't this wonderful? This is exactly what medical school is going to be about. <laughs> <laughs> and I almost threw up right there. The next day I became an economist. I changed my major oh. to economics. <laughs> and I graduated and thinking I'll never have to go back to school again because I never loved school. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, I got a job, and after about six months, I realized I really didn't like this job. I wanted to go back into medicine because that was my calling. And so I had to take prerequisites and do all kinds of uh, standing on my heads and taking night classes, and and uh, I finally was able to to get in and uh, uh, get into medicine. There, there were actually a couple strange coincidences that happened on the way that uh, I mentioned in the book, too, uh, getting me uh, – uh, to, to in the medical school. Yeah, and can we bring up what, since you're just outside Chicago, just so everybody knows, we were chatting about that before we started, but what did one of the most powerful physicians in Chicago tell you when you were trying to petition to get in? This was really something. I'll, ne I'll never forget this because it, it made me feel so bad for so long. This was an interview I had for medical school, and this is when I, I was still getting out of my um, college uh, days, and, and I was you know an economics major, and I wasn't doing I didn't do really well in college, and I didn't have my prerequisites, so my test scores weren't very good. So he, I was, I was thrilled to interview with this very powerful dean of, of a major medical school in Chicago, and we had a nice interview. And at the end of the interview, he said, "Mr. Kobaba, you just don't have what it takes to become a doctor. You should just pursue another job." I'm sorry, <laughs> I was devastated. But you know what happened after that was, did you ever have someone say to you, "You can't do this. You just won't be able to do this"? That was that was the incentive. After about a week of of consternation and crying and everything else, I decided I'm going to show him. I'm going to, I'm going to get into medical school. And that was the incentive to really, really work hard. And I, I, I did. I, I got my test scores up. I studied really, really hard. And I got into two medical schools. So the interesting thing about that, Shannon, I don't know if you remember this, is is uh, I got into my residency program at the same institution. After four years of medical school, you get into residency. And I got into residency program at the same institution that what this dean was was uh, the dean of. And what what is poetic justice was there were 35 uh, interns that year. And I was voted by the interns and the attendings as the number one intern of the year. And guess who had to award the prize? <laughs> that very same man who told you to give up. Yep, it was that's poetic justice. I don't know if you remembered, but I remembered, and that was all. It was that that made a difference. So that was kind of interesting. That was the very next thing I had written down. So you went down the perfect path. Yeah, I we had to bring that up because that was uh, that was a great part of the book. And I was going to bring this up at the end, but maybe before we really get into these stories, I think it ties in maybe a little better now. It's it's an important part of this whole thing, also because it it would have maybe been over for you before it even began. Uh, is the story of uh, of the books for organic chemistry? Uh, yeah, that was an interesting. I thought that was a, a coincidence for the longest time until I started getting into this book, and then I realized that was probably wasn't a coincidence at all. Uh, so I'm trying to get into night school to get all these prerequisites because again I was an organ I was a um, economics major and I needed lots of these uh, science prerequisites and one of them was the organic chemistry which is a killer course and that's the one that separates the separates the ones that are interested and ones that aren't and so uh, there were two night I, I was going to working during the day and there were two night schools that offer organic chemistry at night one uh, where in the town I was working in which is wonderful I thought I'd just go from my job right over to the to the school which was like three blocks away and 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 be perfect the other one was Roosevelt University which is downtown Chicago about 70 miles away from my home so I went to the bookstore, bought the organic chemistry book, and found that there were lots and lots of books falling off the shelf in organic chemistry. And I thought, this is going to be a great class. There'll be lots of students there. So I got to the class, and there were three students sitting in the class. And I thought, oh, my, this is interesting. And the professor walked in, didn't even sit down, and said, I'm sorry, we're canceling the class. There aren't enough students. Well, my heart dropped because... I, th I thought my, my life is over. I'll never become uh, a, a doctor because I only had one more year to fool around and, and, and get into or, uh, medical school because I needed to get a job. I had a family that, that, at that time. And, but I then realized that one other school had organic chemistry, Roosevelt. So the next day, I skipped work and went down to Roosevelt and waited in line for the registrar. And I got to the front of the line and I said, I'm interested in enrolling in your organic chemistry class at night. And she said, I'm very sorry. We have a full class. We opened up a second class, which is full. And now we have 10 people on the waiting list. And, and I said, well, you don't understand. I'm going to be a failure in life if I don't get in and all these kinds of excuses. And she said, I'm very sorry. Everyone that's trying to get in is the same story that you do. 
So I said, well, who makes the ultimate decision about organic chemistry? And she said, well, the professor is the only one that can let you in the class at this point because the class was starting like in two days. So I said, where does the professor live? And she said, go to the third floor. He's in his office right now. So I ran up to the third floor. The waiting room was filled with students, I'm sure, with the same idea that I had. And I must have looked like a a real sad person to the uh, secretary Mm -hmm. who said to me, you know, after I explained the situation, she said, if you just want to talk with him for, for one minute, and one minute only, Wait in the ante room. The two professors that are teaching the class are talking right now. So I waited in the ante room, which is just outside the paper thin door, and I could hear everything going on inside. I, you know, didn't necessarily want to, but I, you know, you couldn't help it. And the one professor was saying, "I don't know what we're going to do. We don't have any organic chemistry books for the second class. We've got enough for the first class. The publisher's out of books. There are no books at any of the bookstores around. We checked with all the universities locally, and nothing. Can't find any books." So they didn't know what quite to do, and, and they finished talking, and then the one professor stepped out. The other one signaled for me to come into the into his office, and I did. And he listened with a very bored face. I don't think we even made eye contact. And mm. he said, I'm very sorry. I can't let you in the class. We, we, you know, we've got uh, 10 people on the waiting list, and so the, everything I heard before. And so I realized this was a desperate time for desperate, <laughs> desperate measures. So I said to him, if I can get – books for you. Will you let me in the class? And all of a sudden, he made eye contact, his mm-hmm. eyebrows, up, and my heart's beating in my neck. You know how that goes. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is my life on the line here. And he looked at me, and there was the longest pause. And he said, can you get me 30? And I said, more. Mm-hmm. It was a long pause again. The heart's up in my throat, way up in my throat this time. And he looked at me, and he said, you're in. So I got into organic chemistry. They got all the books in the, at the other university that had books falling off the shelves. They had so many books. Uh, I was a, a hero for them. They were a hero for me and was mutually uh, advantageous. Now, think about the likelihood of how, how likely is it that, that I would be there at that very minute the two professors were talking about the books. Right. I thought it was a coincidence at first, but I later on after doing this book, I, I think there's, it's more than a coincidence. I think I was meant to be there. I was meant to get into medical school, and uh, that's what allowed me to do that. Otherwise, I wouldn't have gone to medical school. I love that story. I appreciate you telling that because that was one of the things that jumped out in the book, and, and that's actually kind of at the culmination of the book after the stories but i'm thinking you know what we i really would like to ask scott about that because i also agree that is more than a coincidence it was a it was a fun occasion and and you know i again all these years uh, for 30 years i thought this was a, kind of a neat coincidence i'd forgotten about it but then after i wrote the book i realized there are there are more things happening and then some other things that happened to me too that were similar to that but not quite as spectacular and how did uh, how did that class go? How scary was organic chemistry? It was terrible. It was a, it was <laughs> yeah. a, it was a terrible class. And, you know, I had a full time job, so I was oh, working. I had to travel my house seventy miles away. So I don't, I hate to admit this, Shannon, but I propped the organic chemistry book up on my steering wheel, which had a nice little pocket for the book. Mm-hmm. And I was formulas as I was driving. Fortunately, I, I didn't kill anyone or myself. But, uh, you know, when you're working full time, you have two hours to go to class and two hours back. You've got to do something with that time to study. Right. And so I got I didn't get an A. I got a B. But that was enough to get into medical school. Great story. I love that. Thanks, Scott, for recounting that. Thanks, Shannon. So as far as why you wrote the book uh, and we'll get into I want to talk, of course, about what happened 10 years ago with Taylor Johnson and that mm-hmm. kind of be our. Uh, inception into the other stories. But once you decided to do this, did you find that some of the colleagues that actually did end up in the book were hesitant at first? Yeah, a lot of doctors were, were hesitant because the doctors that I that I asked, now there are a lot, in every profession, as you know, there are, there are people on the edge and there are people in the mainstream, okay? And the, and the doctors I wanted were the doctors in the mainstream, the ones that, that didn't brag, that didn't have grandiose stories. And, you know, everyone that, that's in a certain profession has knows people in, in that category. So these were the ordinary docs that everyone sees that uh, that I go to see for a, a broken whatever or, or a, you know, urologic problem or whatever. So these... These were ordinary docs that had nothing to gain by telling me a story. They had everything to lose. And, and their concern was, 
if they told me a story about a premonition they had or a dream or seeing a ghost, patients would think they're crazy mm -hmm. and not go to them. And that was a real concern. And I think my, my thought uh, and the reason I think these doctors told me the stories ultimately was, was because, and again, I mentioned this in the book, most of them are savvy do-gooders. They want to do good in the world every day. They want to help someone. They want to make a difference in the world. And I think they recognize that telling these stories to the world would help people in tough situations, in tough times, and give them hope and give them some faith that there's something else out there. And I think that was the overarching reason that these doctors let me publish stories that could actually hurt their practices. It turned out that none of the doctors have said anything about anyone uh, bad-mouthing them for, for coming out with these stories. And in fact, most of the doctors have said people are thanking them for bringing these stories out because from my experience, and, and many of the doctors now are experiencing this too, almost everyone that we see, either their family or themselves, have had an unusual experience that they can't explain scientifically. And it's just something that happened, a strange, unusual coincidence or something. And, and they all now feel better about telling those stories to others that now that the doctors have told their stories. So I think it's it's brought out uh, in in patients and doctors both a, a sense that it's okay to talk about these kinds of spiritual things that uh, we haven't talked about before at all. That's good. I'm very happy to hear that. So you've been in this profession for a very long time, and you're in doctors' lounges and you know water cooler talk. I mean, is this the kind of thing that? I mean, do you guys talk about this stuff ever? I mean, no. even if it's not for a, a book purpose. Never, never. We don't talk about these kinds of things. I think people have been traditionally embarrassed about these kinds of things. And I've never heard, up until the last five years when I started the book, I've never heard any stories like this at all from a doctor. Doctors talk about um, their golf game or their patients and mm -hmm. the surgeries they had, who died or whatever. But I've never heard a story, maybe maybe once, but but uh, that would be very unusual. This is not the kind of conversation that we have at all, uh, surprisingly. I think we'll have it, we'll have it more uh, in the future. But uh, uh, in the past, we've not talked about this at all. Well, let's talk now a little bit about maybe how some of these ideas came to you and how, okay, well, I'm surely I'm not the only one that has these types of things happen. So if we could just talk a little bit about what happened 10 years ago with Taylor Johnson. Sure. Taylor Johnson uh, was a patient and um, he was traveling in the South. I think it was Arkansas. And he called me up and he said, I was having this abdominal pain, uh, right upper abdominal pain, which is a typical gallbladder location. And I said, well, Taylor, go to the you know emergency room. You, you, it came on after eating. It sounds like gallbladder and have them do some ultrasounds and some blood work and so forth. So he did. About two hours later, I got a call from the ER doc, and he said, I'm seeing Taylor Johnson here. He's uh, having classic gallbladder symptoms, but the ultrasound was normal. His blood tests were normal. His white count was okay. And uh, we gave him some pain medication. He's fine now, and we're, we're sending him home. And I said, that's fine. Have him come back and see me when he, when he um, uh, comes back into, into town. So about three days later, Taylor Johnson showed up, and he was in my office. And he, he was saying, I still have this abdominal pain. It can be quite severe at times. And it sounded like classic gallbladder. So I got some fancier gallbladder tests, a HIDA scan and a few things like that, and some more sophisticated uh, liver tests and, and a number of other things. And, and uh, everything was perfectly normal. It was really troubling because I, um, I don't like to ever not know what's going on with a person when they have some sig significant pain. So I, I slept on this for a couple nights trying to figure out what the heck we needed, need to be doing. And then uh, one morning I woke up. Uh, pretty early in the morning, and I knew that he needed a lung scan. Now, that really was not uh, a thing that I normally do. I, 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 and what I did is I, I called him up, and I said, Taylor, and I was almost embarrassed to, to say this, uh, I know you're having abdominal pain, but I, I just had this feeling that you needed a lung scan today. And he said, well, I kind of laughed. He said, oh, I can't have it today because I'm flying out to Denver because he was traveling quite a bit. And I said, well, what time is your flight? And he said, well, at 2 o'clock. And I said, well, if I can get it in first thing in this morning, w would you would you go for it? And he said, oh, you know, there's a long pause. And he finally agreed, humored me. 
So then I had to call the x-ray department and twist their arm to get an emergency lung scan in. Yeah. And yeah. They, they finally agreed, uh, after I twisted their arm a little bit harder than I normally would, uh, they said, just send him over. So about an hour later, I got a call from the radiologist. And he said, good call, Scott. And I said, what do you mean? So he had a large pulmonary embolus sitting on his diaphragm. That's mm. why he had abdominal pain and not chest pain. Not uh, chest pain. And had he gone to Denver, he probably would have died because he was going to very likely have other blood clots on that flight. And so I got goosebumps at that point and realized that uh, I was just given a, 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 a some kind of a unusual information that I normally wouldn't have had, and and resulted in saving his life. He ended up uh, going to the hospital, obviously, immediately. We treated him with blood thinners, and we discovered that he had a hereditary clotting disorder that made him predisposed to blood clots, and uh -huh. he's on blood thinners now forever and um, doing extremely well. And, and uh, you know, that was just – I suppose you could say that was a coincidence or something else, but to me, that was just such a, such a powerful feeling that morning that I had – that I just, and I, again, I normally have my nurse call the patients in the morning, but I just picked up the phone and called him and made all the arrangements myself. So that was one of the first experiences I had in something that was beyond what I could explain. And then, uh, interestingly, a couple other docs within about a month of having that experience came to me with other stories. And that got me to thinking, I wonder how many docs really have these stories. And that's when I started hanging out in the doctor's lounge, which is a wonderful place to hang out with all kinds of great food. And I would mm -hmm. ask docs if they had any, any experiences that uh, they couldn't explain scientifically. And a lot of them did. And the ones I like to include in the book, were, and I interviewed probably 200 docs. The ones I included in the book were ones that gave me goosebumps or made me tear up uh, in emotion. And you could tell right away what 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 the good stories were. I, and I just listened. You know, we're, everyone's busy in the morning when you're rushing in to get rounds done and so forth. But they could tell me in 30 seconds or a minute, and I knew that that was a good story. And then I would get back to them in the night and, and a few, you know, multiple time, multiple phone phone calls to to finish up getting the story right. But uh, that's that's pretty much how how it went. And uh, I was shocked. I was really surprised at how many docs, ordinary docs that are run-of-the-mill good people that don't have any um, strange characteristics had these really unusual, uh, incredible stories. So how about when you're in the lounge and you've, you said you've talked to over 200 doctors for all of mm -hmm. this. There are a few that you've heard the stories, but they won't allow it to be published? Uh, there was, there were actually, uh, two circumstances I had, there was one, uh, doctor that had an incredible story about a young girl that was three years old that, that, uh, as she was dying, she was seeing angels flying ab ab above her and uh, she kept moving her head around in circles. And they finally, the doc that was in charge said, what are you doing? And she said, I'm, I'm looking at the angels, but I can't, they have wings and I can't fly. Aww. Still gives me, <laughs> makes me oh, choke. Gosh. Yeah. And I thought this was an incredible story. But the parents, uh, you know, you have to get permission for all these things. And right. the parents, we can't give you permission to tell this story because uh, it's, it's too emotional for us. And if the world's going to be reading this story, they're going to be contacting us. And, and uh, we don't want to have that. So that was, right. that was one. And then the other one was um, a doc that had a stroke himself. And this was a story about him and his stroke, and he didn't want anyone to know because it didn't leave him paralyzed, so he didn't want anyone to know. So he's the one that's anonymous in the book. Everyone else has, has uh, their name attached to their story except mm -hmm. for this one. Those, those are just the two. And otherwise, uh, I think the docs, again, wanted to make a difference in the world, and they wanted people to know that there's something else out there. And uh, that's why they allowed these stories to be published. Probably felt so great to tell those stories. I mean, even yours. I'm sure it just feels great to say, yes, I, I really do think there's something besides what we can see and feel and uh, hear in, in this life. Yeah, yeah. And we were, it's interesting, we were, um, I got the story from the docs. And, and you know, this was this was a while ago now for, and, and for, for many of them, a couple of years and we were doing some filming. There's a film crew that that's interested in in doing this as a television series, and we had the docs come out to to be interviewed for the for the film. And what's interesting is after they 
have realized that this is okay, the story uh, is even more spectacular than, <laughs> than what they told me. Right. And and uh, I I was surprised that that uh, you know some of these were, were really uh, really interesting and really unusual, and even more unusual when they actually could be uh, less afraid to, to tell the whole thing. And uh, some of the stories I, I had, they're, they're pretty good. But but uh, when I heard some of the docs uh, tell the, the whole thing that they realized now they wouldn't be criticized for, mm -hmm. they were more spectacular than some of the stories in the book. It was interesting. Wow. Scott, when it, when it came to the little girl th that was passing away and seeing these angels, what she said was mm -hmm. angels, and... And, of course, I don't even know if you know or would want to answer this, and I can't even imagine losing a child. Did the parents feel comforted by what she was saying? Yes. Yeah, they did. Um, and the mother especially uh, asked the doctor, uh, do you think that, that she really is seeing angels? And the doctor said yes, and that was oh. very comforting. Can you imagine? There was another story that um, I had from John Saran, who's a uh, internist. One of his patients was dying of, of colon cancer, and he was in, in hospice, and he was at his home. And um, he was getting very close to the end of, of life, and, and his wife was there, and he was there. They were alone. And he said to his wife, did you see those, do you see those girls dancing in the, in the corner? And, he, and she said, uh, no, where are they? And, she, and he described three girls, little uh, uh, young girls, dressed in white, dancing in a circle in the corner. And his wife, who uh, was very astute and very attuned to what was happening, uh, went along with him. And she said, those must be the angels that have come to, to get you. Mm -hmm. And so he said to her, well, it's, it's probably close to time. I'm, uh, if you can take care of things on the earth, I'll take care of things uh, in heaven. And she said, that's, that's a good agreement. And he closed his eyes, and, and then he died. So I think um, there are angels out there that, that uh, may come and, and take us away or that may participate in our lives in unusual and strange ways. Oh. Well, uh, I, yeah, and actually, John Saran, we're going to – that's one of the gentlemen that I picked for later in the show for, uh, for Jason the Jet. So, oh, wow. That's a good – those are really powerful stories, though. Uh, I can see where people get a little, little choked up hearing that kind of stuff. So, uh, all right. Well, let's let's jump in here. And I think that I'm probably going to mispronounce this name. It's David Mokul or Mochel, MD? Mokul. Oh, Dave Mokul. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so it's a Mary's Christmas Carol. That's a good one. Dave was one of the first. Actually, Dave is probably uh, the one that got me really started on this. I had... The couple experiences that I mentioned to you, but then uh, when Dave came to me, <clears throat> he was one of the ones that tipped me over and, and that made me decide that I better start writing these down. Dave Mokel is an ordinary uh, general uh, orthopedic surgeon. He has done a lot of total joint surgeries. He's a great guy, very conservative, uh, busy practice, very successful, very smart. And um, Dave, on the, one of the floors in the hospital, came running up to me, literally, and grabbed me by the arm and said, Scott, I've got to tell you this incredible story. I said, okay, Dave, tell it to me. And I said, oh, I can't tell it to you here, he said. Uh, so we went into a patient's room. And I said, well, why can't you tell me, Dave? And he said, well, someone will think I'm crazy if I tell you this story. So he, he closed the door and he proceeded to tell me about a mutual patient, Mary, who had uh, needed ankle surgery, and Dave was operating on her ankle, was going to. She was in the OR. Uh, and she had been given the um, antibiotic just before the surgery started. She was unconscious, uh, and, and she was uh, intubated. But then she arrested. Her heart stopped, uh, no respirations, no uh, uh, eyes closed, nothing, no response to pain. She was basically dead. So they started the code, uh, which they do, obviously, when the person arrests, and they did CPR. And one of the guys that, that was doing CPR was a, a guy, a tech, that came in from the room next door, and he had bright red hair underneath his operating room cap. And he wasn't doing it adequately enough because when you do CPR, you've got to push really hard and, and pretty far down to get the heart to, to uh, eject blood. And so Dr. Bolk was feeling the pulse, didn't feel a pulse, so he asked the, the tech to, to step aside while he could 
well, he did the, the CPR himself. Well, the tech didn't step aside after a couple of requests. And, you know, since this is not a polite affair, it's a life and death situation, he just pushed him aside and took over doing CPR. Well, finally, Mary came to. She didn't wake up, but her heart started and everything else seemed to come back to normal. And they, they finally discovered that it was the antibiotic that had caused her to arrest. And a couple of days later, after she had totally recovered, no surgery on her ankle, but she'd recovered from the arrest. Uh, Dr. Molka went in to give her some final instructions about the ankle and what to do and so forth. And, and she interrupted him and said, uh, Dr. Molka, thank you for saving my life. And since Dr. Molka is a pretty you know, ordinary guy and doesn't want to take credit for it very much, she just said, no, it's a team effort. There were lots of us in there. And she said, no, no, I saw you push that guy with the red hair aside and, mm -hmm. and take over doing CPR. And that's when I came back. Well, Dr. Molka... <laughs> got a little weak in the knees, had to sit down even though he's late for his office. And he said, what, what do you mean? And he's trying to figure out how she could do this. And she said, when I arrested, I rose up to the top of the room and I was able to see everything that happened. And she mentioned all the minutia of the things that happened in the room that Dr. Mokel knew, but no one else uh, uh, could have told her all those, all those things. Mm. And she said, when I, when I was there, my grandmother came to me, who had been dead for a long time, and said, it's not my time to come to heaven. But if I was a good and kind person, I would be able to uh, go back to, to the grandmother at some point in a special place in, in heaven that the grandmother would save for her. And so before this, Mary was not a wonderful person, I must say. She was kind of the type where you, every time you see her in the office, there you'd done something wrong. You didn't uh, fill her prescription right or you, mm -hmm. you were late for seeing her or whatever. It was just not a pleasant situation. After the rest, she was the kindest, most wonderful person. She'd bring us cookies and she'd help her widowed father. And she was the wonderful, wonderful person. She didn't live a long time after that because she had some major medical problems. But she did live long enough to make everyone realize that she was just a wonderful, totally changed person. And I called the story Mary's Christmas Carol just because it reminds me of Scrooge and how uh, he went through a similar uh, dream and uh, came back, uh, mm. uh, you know, a totally different person. So that's yeah. Mary's Christmas Carol. So it's amazing transformation and an amazing story. That's what got me going. When I heard that story from a very conservative, ordinary doc Dr. Mogul, not ordinary, he's exceptional, right. but not, um, uh, you know, he doesn't have, doesn't tell stories. But when he told this one, uh, I just, I said, I said to myself, I've got to see if other doctors have had these experiences. And sure enough, they did. And that's what got me into the book. It's incredible. I mean, how do you even begin to explain that? She's coding completely unconscious. Her eyes are closed. I mean, she's literally getting chest compressions, yes. CPR, and she can see everything. She explained in every detail what was going on, even the guy with the red hair. Yeah, she did. And that's what that's what just Dr. Mokul said, I, I can't explain that. It's got to be, oh. it's got to be something uh, really unusual, and and uh, you know this near death experience, which uh, when you know after after getting into these stories, these kinds of things happen with some regularity. Yeah. Well, Scott, let's jump into one that you were involved with, you and John Bourne, and it's titled Gus's Last Salute. Oh, uh, that's a good one. Uh, you know, every doc. Docs may not admit it, but every doc has favorite patients. And, you know, I don't know why. Some are just neat people or fun people or whatever. And Gus was one of my favorites. Gus and Lucy, who's his, his wife. And I took care of Gus for a long time. Gus had some war wounds from uh, World War II in his legs, and he couldn't walk very, very well. And every time I could. I could tell it was Gus because of the, the typical limp that he had. I, even though I couldn't see, I was in the exam room, I could hear him walking down the hall because of the, the typical typical limp. And uh, it was fun to see Gus and, and so, see him raise his family. I took care of him for a long, long time. And finally, he, he, he became old. He was in the 90s, and um, he was getting worse and worse. He had Alzheimer's, developed Alzheimer's disease and finally couldn't speak at all. And so... Uh, I um, one day I, I was visiting him. I used to make house calls to him, and, and I was visiting Lucy, who was a nurse, a phenomenal nurse, a World War II uh, nurse. And I and I said, "Well, tell me." I never really learned the story of Gus's war wounds, and evidently Gus was going into Germany with his platoon, um, and they were, there was lots of fighting and lots of shells and bullets and all kinds of stuff, and the the stench from the the 
burning flesh and the the forest and so forth was all over the place and it was finally toward the evening and and uh, they decided to take a break and the the shells and so forth kind of quieted down and they they formed a smoking circle and Gus didn't smoke so he was away from the circle and all of a sudden there was a lone shell that came in right into the middle of this smoking circle and blew up and all, it killed all the the uh, men in the in this, this circle instantly Gus was badly wounded in his legs and they didn't find find him till the next day. It's amazing he didn't bleed to death. But they decided to take his legs off. Uh, they amputated both legs because they were so, so badly uh, just damaged. <clears throat> well, Gus uh, appealed to the commanding officer and said, "Is there isn't there anything you can do to save my legs? Because in those days, if you didn't have legs, you couldn't get a job. You know, he would he would just be a disabled person all of his life." And and so. They shipped him off to England, then back to the United States, where there was a special uh, surgeon that was doing this kind of uh, surgery. And they had he had 17 operations ultimately, and uh, met Lucy in the um, uh, in the hospital, and they got they got married. So uh, that was Gus's story, and I and it was it was quite a quite a story that that he told, and and. Uh, I loved Gus and I loved Lucy. And one morning, I was making rounds in the hospital about seven o'clock in the morning, and. I got a call from Lucy, and she said, I'm just sorry to say that Gus finally died. And that was, you know, you get a tear in your eye, even though uh, you you try to be hardened and uh, not uh, too emotional. But uh, again, uh, I was I was pretty sad over the whole thing. And it's interesting that I, I finished my rounds and went downstairs, and in the doctor's lounge again, my, I saw my partner, John Bourne. And uh, I said, John, I just want to let you know Gus died this morning. And John turned a shade of white I've never seen before. He had to sit down. And I said, what's the matter? And he, had to, he regained his composure. And he said, uh, that's the strangest thing because on, on the way here in my car, I always listen to the news. I, I never shut the news off because I like to hear what's going on in the world before I make my rounds. And this morning, I felt I had to shut the news off. And as soon as I did, I started thinking about Gus. And it was, and Gus wasn't his patient. Gus was my patient, so he didn't really have a good reason to think about about Gus. And he thought about his war uh, uh, situation and what he went through and his war wounds that that disabled him the rest of his life. And and he said, I, I, I just felt that there was something that was happening with Gus. And and uh, uh, I and, and I said, what time did you shut the radio off? And he said, about just before seven. Mm. That's when Gus died, and we both we both decided that that uh, this was Gus's way of of uh, saying goodbye, and and uh, just as he died, he I think he was able to contact us and and give us what we call one last salute. They were the doctors that had taken care of him for thirty years, so it was pretty pretty emotional and pretty moving. But yeah. uh, I'll never forget the look on Dr. Bourne's face that that ghost, <laughs> that ghostly look when he realized that his death. Uh, coincided with the exact time he was felt an urge to shut off his radio and, and listen to uh, his thoughts about Gus. That's amazing. And yeah. Gus was uh, ninety when he passed, right? Uh, I mean, after all that he had been through. Yeah, about ninety-three. He uh, had a wonderful life, 93. and Lucy's still around. Uh, she's the most incredible nurse I've ever. <laughs> I've oh, ever Lucy's heard. still wow. She's that's alive. Oh. that's great. Yeah. They were born. They were both born on uh, Valentine's Day, one year apart, oh, which is interesting. Wow! Yeah, they were they were meant to meet, right? Mm -hmm. oh. Actually, Gus had a hangover when they met, <laughs> and he was going into the, into the mess hall in the hospital to get some tomato juice, and oh. he asked Lucy where the tomato juice was because he had a hangover, and that's how they met. So, kind of interesting oh, sto that's story. That's a great story. I mm. love that. Oh, thanks for adding that in there. That's a cool little touch there with the hangover. That yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the story gone fishing with John Messett. That's a that's a good one. John Messett is a gynecologist. I've used him for gynecologic issues, and and uh, he became good friends with Bob Cornell. Bob Cornell is a family practice doc, and you know when the family practice docs run into troubles with deliveries, they call the gynecologist and obstetricians in. So. Uh, Dr. Cornell used to use Dr. Messett occasionally, and, and they became good friends. And they would, again, meet in the doctor's lounge, the ultimate meeting place for <laughs> anyone in the hospital, I think. And they would they would chat in the morning. And uh, they chatted about the two things that they loved most, fishing and their families. 
And Bob Cornell was the ultimate fisherman. There was no doctor that's uh, a better fisherman than 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 uh, Cornell. He he knew every lure to use in every body of water in the whole country and some foreign countries. I'm convinced. And so they would have a lot of fun in 15 or 20 minutes in the morning talking about fishing and and uh, their families. And one day, uh, John Messett went to the uh, uh, doctor's lounge, and Bob Cornell wasn't there. He realized he was, uh, was admitted to the hospital the night before. He had a massive stroke. He was in the ICU, basically, essentially brain dead, according to the ICU doc. So Dr. Messett ran up to see him as soon as he realized this, and uh, he was in his little cubicle, and, and the ER, the, uh, the, the doc that was the intensivist that was in charge of the intensive care unit told him that uh, they're going to let him go for a couple more days just to see if anything comes back, and if not, they're going to unplug him in about three days just uh, because there's no sense in keeping him alive because he's basically dead. So Messett, you know, when you when you have a friend – you sometimes don't realize how close that friend is until the friend is, is gone. And so Dr. Messett realized how much he actually loved him and how much he loved to be with him in the mornings like that. They didn't socialize very much, but they just had a wonderful relationship. And so Messett didn't know what to do. You know, you're, you're, you feel helpless. Here's a person lying there essentially dead, and you want to do something. As, and as docs, we always want to do something. There must be something we can do. So he decided, uh, he closed the curtain on the little cubicle and went close to Dr. Cornell's face and he started to tell him stories. Now he thought to himself, this is crazy. I'm telling this guy who's, who's uh, essentially brain dead stories. And he told him stories about fishing. He had a major fishing trip to the Mackenzie River in, in Canada, which is by the Great Slave Lake, and they caught so many graylings that he couldn't even, uh, his arms got too tired reeling them in. And he told every day, he went back to, to tell Cornell a little bit more about this, and uh, uh, John Messett's wife uh, told him he, he, she thought he was crazy to, mm -hmm. to tell uh, you know, these stories. Why are you telling him these stories? And he just felt like he had to tell him stories like this. He, that, that's the one thing he felt he could do. He couldn't do anything else. Well, the, the day that uh, Dr. Cornell was supposed to be unplugged, uh, Dr. Messett went in there early in the morning to say goodbye to him. And he realized he was too late. The room was, well, the room was empty. It was, the lights were out. The bed was taken down. And, and he realized he had died the night before. So he went to the nurse and he said, what time did Dr. Cornell die? And she, the nurse laughed and mess it. Got pretty mad, I think, at that. Yeah. And she said, he didn't die. He went down to the, he woke up yesterday, went down to the step-down unit. Well, when they, they uh, made connections again in a couple of days because he was offered a bunch of tests and things, uh, Dr. Cornell uh, said to, to Dr. Messett, uh, you know, uh, John, thank you for telling me those stories, especially the ones about the Graylings uh, great, uh, by the Great Slave Lake mm. and the McKenzie River. I love the, the part about you landing with the float plane and how nervous you were. And he mentioned all the details, and Messett was totally blown away. He said, Did, you mean you heard everything I said? And he said, absolutely. And Dr. Messett began to think uh, that these were, these were things that, that uh, Bob Cornell absolutely loved. And you wonder, you know, I, I'm convinced that when people get really close to death, they sometimes have a choice of crossing that river or staying on, the, on this side. And he's always wondered if uh, if Cornell was at that point where he could just decide, should he leave or should he stay? And he's wondering if those stories about fishing uh, and the thing that Bob Cornell loved so much mm -hmm. kept him on this side. Uh, we'll never know for sure, but... Uh, Cornell lived a number of years after that, ultimately died of an unrelated cause, and um, never made it to the uh, Mackenzie River, at right. least not not in this lifetime. Right, not in this life. Uh, because, and just to reiterate to everyone, at least the doctors that were taking care of Dr. Bob Cornell, they were saying that he was completely unresponsive and brain dead, and that's why they were talking about actually executing just, you know, uh, pulling the plug, saying goodbye to him. Yeah. yeah, that's a standard thing that happens when a person's brain dead. You know, you let them go for a little bit to make sure that there's nothing going on, and, and then uh, you say, this, this, is, this is it. But uh, he came back, interestingly, and, and he heard everything that Mess had said and everything anyone said, and he said that I could hear the people talking around me, but uh, uh, no one realized I could hear hear what they were saying, which is very interesting. That was one of my favorites, for sure, is him just recounting every detail. I mean, even naming the kind of fish that yeah. that he was catching yeah. with the graylings. 
Yeah. And uh, Mesa told him he, you know, they always, fishermen always like to one up each other. And, and Mesa told him that they caught these on the smallest uh, lure that uh, you can imagine. It was a, uh, what do they call this name of the lure? Uh, daredevil, smallest daredevil. Mm. Uh, Me- uh, 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 Cornwall uh, 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 had never used that particular lure. So uh, that was uh, Messet's way of one upping him. Um, <laughs> that, that he, he used a lure that was smaller than one he had ever used, the other uh, fisherman had never used. So uh, interesting. And he brought that up, the daredevil. Yep. yep. Unreal. Wow. Little dare- That's a good one. Well, this, this next one, Scott, that I chose also involves you, and it's called Three-Way Phone Call to Heaven. That was an interesting experience, and there's a number of take-home lessons on that one. Uh, Sharon uh, was one of Dr. Bourne's patients, and when I, there are two two of us in our practice, and so uh, every other weekend we cover for each other. And I was covering for him, and he admitted uh, it was interesting that what happened with Sharon. Sharon showed up in the emergency room. Everyone seems to show up on Friday afternoon when you want to get out of town or something like that. So John was was planning on a weekend away. And Sharon shows up about 4.30, 5 o'clock on, on Friday afternoon. And uh, the ER doc called him up and said, I've got this this lady here that uh, has had a joint surgery a couple months ago. And she's uh, a history of asthma. And Dr. Boren told her not to live with her daughter uh, when she was recovering because the daughter had cats and was a smoker uh, because of her asthma. And he said, you're going to have an asthma attack. And sure enough, she had an asthma attack. And she was in the ER Friday afternoon, just before Dr. Bourne was ready to leave. And the, the ER doc said to Dr. Bourne, you know, I think we can probably send her home. Uh, and Dr. Bourne just had this funny feeling that maybe she needs to be in the hospital, despite having, you know, it would have been easy to say that and then go home and take off on his trip. But he had this funny feeling that he, she needed to come in the hospital. So he said to the ER doc, I'll come and see her. I'll uh, my, call my wife. <laughs> you know, wives are, are um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're used to this kind of uh, yeah. thing in the afternoon. So uh, he went to see her. And sure enough, she had an asthma attack. And, and uh, uh, he signed her out to me. And the uh, next morning I saw her. And she indeed, you know, was doing a little bit better. He wasn't wheezing as much. And it was all explained by having a little... Uh, probably a little pneumonia on top of uh, being exposed to cats and smoke and so forth. And so I reduced some of her medications and uh, thought this, you know, this is not going to be too difficult. Maybe I'll even send her home in a couple of days. And so the next day I had rounds and she was worse. And um, it's interesting when I entered the room, uh, she was on the phone. And most people, it's really nice, you know, for doctors that most people will say, oh, the doctor just came in, you know, I need to hang up the phone. I yeah. love that because it, <laughs> it takes some time. But uh, she didn't hang up the phone. And uh, she was talking, and then she was quiet and closed her eyes for the longest time. And so I decided not to leave. I, I sat down in the room. And, you know, uh, I was really uncomfortable because here I am with this person who's got her eyes closed on the phone, and I'm trying to figure out what to do with my hands and what to do with my legs and right. kind of swarming around in the chair trying to act like I'm not mm-hmm. listening, doing something else. And then I began to think, I wonder if we've got the right diagnosis here. And I guess I, I kept thinking, well, maybe, you know, could there be anything else going on with her? And, and then I thought, maybe I need to order some additional tests just, just to make sure that there's nothing else going on. And then, I, then my mind, my, the other side of my mind would say, no, no, she's got typical asthma. She has a little pneumonia. Why, do, why look any, for any tr- all that more trouble? And then on the other side of my brain would say, well, no, no, you need to look at some other things just in case. And so she finally finished the phone call, hung up. And uh, I said, you know, Sharon, we're going to just do a few additional tests. I, the, the one side of my brain uh, got the best of me. And so I ordered a couple tests. One is called the D-dimer. The D-dimer is a test for blood clots. And if you have blood clots, the D-dimer can be very high. Normal is about 0 to 300 in our lab. And so about an hour later, I got a call from the nurse. And she said, yeah, Sharon's D-dimer was 1,800. And I thought, oh, my goodness, that's really high. I said, let's get a stat lung scan. Sure enough, she had multiple blood clots in her lung, all over the lungs, which could have been fatal any time. And I called Sharon, and I said, because I was home at the point at this this time, I said, Sharon, we're going to move you to the intensive care unit. We're going to start you on a blood thinner. And um, she said, well, I knew you'd come up with a diagnosis. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, uh, when I was on the phone, the phone call was from my minister. And my minister, uh, we, we said a prayer. That's why I closed my eyes. And I, I felt a little bit better because now I know why her eyes were closed. 
and he prayed that you would come up with a diagnosis right then mm. and and know exactly what to do with me. And that's exactly what I was thinking about. This one half of my brain was telling me to to do some additional testing, and that's when I did the, the D-dimer. And she said, I knew you would come up with the answer because um, my minister was praying, and and and, uh, and sure enough, uh, I, I knew there was something else going on, and, and, and there was. And we, she did really fine on the blood thinners. In a couple of days, she was a lot better, and we were able to send her home probably in about three days from, from when I'd seen her on the weekend. So that was really uh, a close call that I think we had uh, a three-way conversation to heaven uh, on that one. You've got quite the intuition, if that's the word for it, right? I mean, I think it's uh, that's maybe putting it lightly between that and, and you've got Taylor and I, I. what is that? I don't even know how to describe what that is. I, my partner says to me uh, that... Um, he always listens to that little voice in the back of his head. Mm -hmm. And if the little voice tells him that there's something else going on here, he pays attention to that because he's been saved a number of times uh, by listening to that. He had one case where he was pre-oping a guy that was scheduled for joint surgery. And the little voice in the back of his head after he saw the person uh, said that, you know, you probably should look at the heart situation with him. Uh, you know, he's got a few risk factors. I think you should probably do some some heart tests. So he called the guy up and he said, I'm, I think we better do a, a treadmill stress test. And the guy said, well, I'm not going to do a stress test before surgery. And he said, well, I'm not going to clear you until you until you have the stress test. So that was a real incentive to get the stress test. And sure enough, he failed the stress test badly. He had major coronary disease. Wow may have died on the operating table when he had the um, the total joint surgery and so he's convinced that there's some little there's a little voice in the back of the of our heads uh, that uh, will help us out if we listen and that's one of the points of the book is listen to those things because I think we all have those little voices sometimes that tell us some things that uh, we need to listen to and if we do it may uh, it, it may save our lives or save somebody else's life you know, and even besides, uh, you know, someone talking about floating above their own body or overhearing conversations when they're supposed to be in a deep coma or in seeing angels, you guys get looks when you order a test that doesn't really quite go along with the symptoms. So I know exactly, I, I, I have a family with kind of a medical background, so I kind mm -hmm. of, uh, I, I realize that, you know, there's, it's kind of like a by the book situation and you're supposed to yes. do this because there's those yes. symptoms and you yes. guys to, to kind of go off that inner voice, you even get looks just for that. Absolutely. These, these days, medicine's changed over the years and these days medicine's a lot of protocols. So a person comes in the hospital with pneumonia, there's a protocol for what antibiotic you're supposed to use, how long you use it, uh, what the dose is based on their kidney function and so forth. So we, we follow these protocols, but you know, sometimes medicine's not an exact science, and sometimes you run into situations that just don't go by the book, and you have to listen to your conscience and listen to your experience. And um, and and if you if you don't, sometimes you'll get into trouble. And yeah. and so, uh, but you know, we are we are subject to being criticized if we order a test. Now, you know, we're not ordering all kinds of crazy tests, but sometimes you just get that feeling that there's uh, something you need to look at here. And uh, it's not quite in the book protocol. And uh, frequently it, it saves, it, it, it uh, results in a, an amazing uh, uh, cure or, 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 uh, a cure, uh, or, or saves someone's life, some, someone's life. Yeah. And thank goodness that some of you guys actually listen to that, that still small voice, right? That inner voice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Well, this final story I chose because when I read it, I'm kind of going, there's no way, there's no way that you cancel all these flights and then you end up here and you're doing this thing and it's uh, it's John Saran and the title of the story is Jason the Jet. Yeah, John Saran uh, became famous uh, uh, over this at least for a couple of days. John Saran was really stressed out, you know, and we can get that way pretty easily by doing, you know, as much work as we do and 
being on the weekends and so forth. So he needed a vacation away. And he, he and his wife decided they're going to get away somewhere. So they, they made plans um, to go to, I think the first one was to New York. New York. And after about a, a four or five days, they decided, no, that's not where we need to go. And so they made plan. They, they canceled their flight. Thank goodness they were in Southwest, which you can cancel the flight and All then right. schedule somewhere else. Um, and so they decided to go to San Antonio, and they made a, a reservation for San Antonio. Well, they didn't feel that that was appropriate after a day or two, and they canceled that one. And then they made a flight uh, reservation for somewhere else, and that didn't turn out. And then they decided to go to Salt Lake City to Robert Redford's uh, uh, ski resort. Well, they could only get one person on the flight, uh, and the other person would have to take a different flight. But nevertheless, they still decided that this was the place they had to go. So it was a little strange that they couldn't both get on the same plane. Ultimately, when somebody canceled, they were able to get on the same plane. So they were flying to, to Salt Lake, and uh, about halfway there, this girl that was sitting in front of them, they were in the back, very back of the plane. The girl sitting in front of them was, was moaning and, and complaining about some tummy ache. And, and um, uh, it turns out that she was pregnant, and it turns out that she was delivering on the flight. Now, she'd never had a baby before. This was a girl uh, that was giving her, her baby up for adoption. And uh, you're not supposed to fly when you're that close to delivery, but she was, and she was in labor. So they realized that the baby was coming. So they bought, they brought her back. You know how big those, those galleys are in the back of the plane? Mm -hmm. They're tiny. So they brought her back to the back galley. They closed the curtain. They had a psych nurse on the floor, uh, on the plane, and also a hospital and a, a school nurse. And plus the stewardess who was in the in the back and and uh, now John Saran is an internist like I am and you know anytime you go to medical school you always do everything in medical school deliver babies and do a part of surgeries and so forth but you never do that when you're in real practice we I haven't delivered a baby for 30 years and nor had John Saran but he took a look at the girl and and sure enough the baby was crowning. And he thought, uh-oh, I'm going to have to deliver this baby, and I haven't delivered a baby in 30 years. So he mm -hmm. said a little prayer that he would be, uh, that everything would go well. And uh, sure enough, the, the baby came out, which uh, usually it does pretty well in most cases, without, with or without a doctor. And uh, he was able to uh, tie off the cord with a shoestring from his um, uh, Johnson & Murphy shoes. And, and when oh, that came out, he got a free pair of Johnson & Murphy shoes. From the <laughs> For life, hopefully. <laughs> the, other, the, other, uh, the other thing he used was a, a, a drawstring from a hoodie. And then he used oh. some of his manicure scissors to cut the cord. And uh, the uh, uh, the pilot who realized, you know, that the baby had been delivered and everyone was happy and successful announced in the PA system that they left the, the um, airport with 185 passengers. And now they just uh, were landing with 186. They made an emergency landing in Denver and dropped the baby off. And uh, uh, every everyone uh, uh, did very well. Uh, the uh, uh, John got a, a picture of the um, baby a couple years later, uh, dressed in a bomber jacket with a flight hat on, and they called it Jason the Jason the Jet. And um, he wondered, you know, he was the only one on the on the plane that was qualified to deliver a baby. No one else knew how to do that, and so you wonder if there was a reason why he canceled all those flights. The interesting thing is. Uh, that this was supposed to be a vacation to, to relax. When he got to Robert Redford's uh, resort, there were about four trucks there with these tall poles and, and uh, 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 the uh, transmitters. And he was interviewed incessantly <laughs> all weekend, oh, uh, appeared on, on some of the talk shows uh, in, a, at, uh, in, the, in his time zone. He got five o'clock to appear on some talk shows. So he didn't get any rest at all on this vacation. But he, he, John's a pretty religious guy and, and pretty spiritual. And he said, you know, I think the Lord had something for me to do. And it wasn't getting any rest. It was uh, doing this. And uh, so he realized that, uh, that he did his, his, his job and, and uh, uh, was, was famous for a couple of days. It's kind of neat. I mean, after canceling all those flights and ending up on that one, I don't know. That's pretty amazing. It really was. And he thought it was something beyond uh, the ordinary. And this is, you know, yeah. he had he was he was on that flight for a reason. Yeah, and then to have his wife there when she was supposed to be separate as well. I remember, she's right. kind of going, "Is is this really happening right now?" You know, we weren't even we were supposed to be in 
basically different countries even. They were talking about Canada at one point, and then they right. end up uh, heading to Utah and that happening. So pretty cool. It really was. So, Scott, were you, throughout the making of this book, were you surprised by any of the stories that were told to you? You know, I was surprised by all of these stories. Uh, I I interviewed so many doctors and got lots of stories. Uh, and there are lots of ordinary stories about little premonitions or little things. But but um, the these stories, the ones that I put in the book, really, every one just blew me away. They're just such amazing stories. And to have ordinary docs tell these stories was just uh, I, I, I'm, I was amazed. I, I just, uh, I was so surprised. And, uh, some of the docs are, are, um, that, that, are, that turned out to be very spiritual. You'd never know it. Uh, we've got one doc, I won't mention his name that, uh, I thought was kind of a crusty kind of a, a doc. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he turned out to be one of the, one of the kindest, uh, doctors when I actually, and, and one of the things that, that really, uh, was interesting for me was to learn about the doctors' backgrounds. Not only did I learn their stories, but I learned about what kinds of things they do in their life that you don't talk about either. And one of the docs, for example, um, there is a uh, reformatory here in, in nearby. It's a, a jail for, for teenagers, basically. And he went there every week for like 10 years to teach the kids uh, about religion and Bible study and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that just, that just shocked me. And got one doc that, um, escaped communist, uh, Romania. And she came to this country and, uh, uh, she was chased by secret service police to get out of the country. Mm -hmm. And she came here. She had no, basically only one out, one or two outfits to wear, no bra. They made tremendous fun of her. Imagine a, a middle school kid, uh, with, you know, uh, old fashioned clothes, only mm -hmm. two pairs and, and no bra and, and she was going to middle school. She was just uh, taunted incessantly. The only thing that she could do to get back was to excel and she did. She was the top of her class in high school, in grade school and middle school and high school, got into a university program uh, and then uh, became a, a very successful surgeon. Okay. So uh, some of the some of the stories from the, from the docs themselves were just Truly amazing stories about amazing people. So what about another book, Scott? What do you think? Are you going to be working on another uh, Physician's Untold Stories Part 2? Yeah, I'm collecting some stories. So if anyone of your listeners has any stories, I'd love to, to get them. Um, we're also working on uh, a potential book for nurses because I think the nurses have some of the more <laughs> interesting stories themselves. They're in the, in the trenches more than yeah. the doctors. Are, and uh, some of the ICU nurses especially have these phenomenal experiences about uh, visions and and uh, people surviving when they uh, really shouldn't have survived and, and uh, uh, power of prayer and a number of things that happen. So that I, I'm, I'm anxious to do a, a nurse's book at some point also. It's a wonderful idea. Well, yeah, where can people get a hold of you? Where's the best place? Uh, physiciansuntoldstories.com is our website, uh, and they can they can get a hold of us there. On the back of the book, there's our address too. Um, let, me, let me just give it to you here. It's a post office box. Uh, Untold Stories, post office box 4407, Wheaton, Illinois 60189, and uh, they can get the book through Amazon.com. Perfect. I just have to say. I knew you were going to be a great interview, and you are. I really appreciate you coming on. And like I said, I have family, uh, you know, with medical background, and I know the sacrifices that all of you guys make. So just a, a huge thank you for what you do. Shannon, thank you. It was a great interview, and, and uh, thanks for spreading the word that there's something else out there and that uh, docs get some help uh, sometimes in strange and unusual places. Well, I'm so-and-so. I was given this name by my parents. I've been to such and such a college. I've done these things in my profession. I produce a little bark. The Buddha says, forget it. There's nothing. That's some story. That's all gone. That's all past. I want to see the real you you are now. But nobody knows who that is. Because we don't uh, know ourselves except through listening to our echoes. And consulting our memories. But then the 
as a real evil, and that again leads us back to this question, uh, who are you? That is the real evil. We shall see how they play with this exam by the cohorts to get you to come out of your shell and find out who you are.
he says, uh, when you settle down in the train to read your newspaper and uh, so on, you are not the same person who uh, a little while ago left the platform. If you think you are, you are linking your moments up in the chain. And this is what binds you to the wheel of birth and death. But when you know that every moment in which you are is the only moment, this comes into Zen, the master will say to somebody, oh, get up and walk across the room. And he comes back and he says, where are your footprints? They've gone. So where are you? Who are you? When we are asked who we are, we usually give a kind of recitation of a history. Straight, 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 straight.